In 1823, tragedy struck a small group of fur trappers and kicked off perhaps the greatest survival story of all time. Hollywood even made a, a movie about this story, so that's how you know it's good. It's called Air Bud. Just kidding. No, it's called The Revenant. So in August 1823, there was a small group of mountain men. These guys were part of a fur trapping expedition, and they were in present-day South Dakota heading west when one of their members, Hugh Glass, was severely mauled by a grizzly bear. He had gone off to hunt alone and surprised a mother with her cubs. Unfortunately, his rifle wasn't enough to stop her charge. Hugh survived, but only narrowly. He was slashed in the throat. He could not speak or walk and could barely eat by forcing food down his throat. So two men were offered extra pay by the trapping company they were with to stay behind with Hugh Glass to assist him and give him a burial should he pass. So after a few days with Glass largely unconscious and severely deteriorated, these two men abandoned him in order to catch up with the others. But they didn't just leave him alone. They took his rifle, knife, tomahawk, flint, steel, powder, and lead. But it turns out Hugh Glass was not unconscious. He knew that these two men had abandoned him, and he began crawling towards the nearest settlement, nearly 350 miles away. And as he crawled, he vowed that should he survive, he would find and murder the men who had left him for dead. One of them was a man who went by the name John Fitzgerald. The other, an 18-year-old named Jim Bridger. Well, you ready? Yeah. Who is this guy? Jim Bridger, famous mountain man. Why? He's probably... Why should everybody know him? Or maybe everyone shouldn't? That's a great question. I've been try- I've been wrestling with that. <laughs> where, does he rank- where does he rank on... Uh, among the mountain men, I'd say he's-, he's right up there. So when I look up mountain man from history, it's like Jim Bridger... James Beckworth, Jedediah Smith, Kit Carson, here's some others, John Coulter, Hugh Glass, John C. Fremont. But he's like, when you think of, if you were going to think of a mountain man, I feel like he would be right up there. Well, the reason why I picked him, so he was born in 1804 and died in 1881. Some people, like Kit Carson was kind of, at the end of the mountain men, but his career like kind of followed the path of the mountain. Cause there was just a little set time there in history, like 20 years where the mountain men were thriving. What does that mean? Mountain man. Uh, I mean, I'm just saying it's synonymous with just people who were out in the Western frontier area of the United States. A lot of them were for, Fur trappers is typically what okay what you're thinking of. So they would go like out for a year, and they a lot of them worked for a fur company, and they would trap beaver typically, or you know okay. whatever they could get for pelts. But they were just trappers. It's not like a recluse, you know. They're no, yeah. So they were out going working for, and got business and stuff. Yeah, they were working trying to make. So they mainly live in the woods and mountains or they just go on like brief expeditions. Yeah. So they come back to a house. No, he didn't have a, he would like live out in the, out in the woods for like 365 days a year. Wow. Just kind of living. And I, he may have had, you know, he probably, I guess, I don't know. They maybe had like little, shacks or whatever i assume he wasn't probably sleeping underneath an oak tree every night yeah I, he wasn't like living in a city i guess or a town or whatever he was just kind of alone but he probably he would have had a shack or something to crash in 
Um, he had a wife and kids, multiple wives. I'll get to that later. So the a lot of the mountain men they would be in companies like they would have uh they would work for some sort of fur company and they'd be in they would kind of travel in groups of people. So it's not you know they a lot of times you think of like the lonely old mountain man just kind of out in the wilderness, but a lot of times they'd be in groups of 20, 30 guys or whatever. Whoa. Uh, but then, yeah, they would, in that case, they're kind of moving around, but then, you know, sometimes there would be just uh, one guy in a shack. So there's all sorts of different, you know, types of ways they would go about it. What kind of a living are these, are they just getting by these guys like him? I mean. Yeah, I don't think they're making a killing. When they were doing their trapping and stuff, they would basically what they would have had they would have had on them pretty much so i mean they didn't have like banks out there or anything like that i mean they're getting paid a little bit but the people who were really making money were the guys who owned Mm -hmm. the fur trading companies and there was a lot of money in fur trapping but the guys like uh bridger and some of these guys they really i don't think saw that money quite like some of the other owners of the company would have these guys have like rivals Rival mountain men, or they just all kind of <laughs> kind of get so. along. So the whatever fur company, like a fur some fur trading company, would put it on. So these are like sanctioned events. Oh, okay. So after uh, the Lewis and Clark expedition, the year he was born was eighteen oh four. Lewis and Clark they traveled up the Mississippi from eighteen oh four to eighteen oh six. So like he's born right when the western frontier is opening so you know like right when mm-hmm. they are kind of Louisiana a purchase finding out what what they have yeah he was one of the first europeans to explore what's now yellowstone just kind of what while he's doing the trapping and everything like that he got up to yellowstone and uh the I don't know too much about Yellowstone, but I guess there's a Bighorn River flowing up there. Okay. He's the first guy and only guy ever to take a raft down the rapids of the Bighorn. Wow. Why'd he do that? <laughs> I don't have any idea. Just Again, to get from no, point A there, to point there, B? I, I, I don't know. I just saw it. There's no How does anyone there. know if he, did he just say he did it? He might have. We'll get to that later. He's got some tall. He's got some tall tales. He was one one of those guys who was known to tell some um, kind of tall tales about himself. But one of his famous stories that he liked to tell a lot was that he was being chased by a hunter, Cheyenne, and they chased him to the edge of a canyon, and then he would allegedly quit. He would just quit talking, and the person would have to say, "Well, what happened?" And he would say, "They killed me." So yeah, he spent 20 years kind of traversing the Western wilderness in the fur trade. And what you were saying earlier, just kind of a note on the fur trade and mountain men and the type of people like the trapping that they did. So from 1825 to 1840, that was like the fur trading companies would at various locations around the United States have, uh, they called it a mountain man rendezvous. But basically, it was just like every year, all these trappers would meet up at this one location and they would trade furs and whatever else. So these guys would, they'd just be out in the woods, like trapping and living off the land for a year. And then somehow they all just knew it was time to like migrate back to, (laughs) (laughs) back to this rendezvous area. These, uh, these rendezvous, if, I was going to pick one place in history to go back and just be at and watch. That would have to be right up there. I mean, a lot of these guys just, can you imagine you haven't seen anyone for an entire year? Then you come back from all accounts. It was just like a, just a ruckus affair, you know, just people firing off pistols and drinking whiskey. And of course they're trading furs and such, Mm -hmm. but and Jim Bridger can't read or write, so there's no quotes from him. But this is uh, James Beckworth, a colleague of Bridger's. He described him as, quote, mirth, which I don't even know what that is, 
quote, mirth, songs, dancing, shouting, trading, running, jumping, singing, racing, target shooting, yarns, frolic with all sorts of extravagances that white men or Indians could. Coffee, sugar, and etc. for several months. The whiskey went off as freely as water, even at the exorbitant price he sold it for. All kinds of sports were indulged in with a heartiness that would astonish more civilized societies. End quote. But yeah, I mean they would have everyone there. I mean, you name it. There'd be well, there'd be wives, children, prostitutes, people trying to sell tobacco or whatever, or buy a fur and have a crazy time. But those went on for that twenty five year spell there and what's just kind of nuts is they would just somehow they all knew where to meet and you know i guess if you're kind of around all these other mountain men and stuff all the you know you probably see someone out trapping and hey well you know (laughs) two more full moons until the (laughs) until the rendezvous like a camp or a town where they meet yeah, they would meet at just kind of different. It was a different location. There were some years it'd be the same sort of place, but it would just be, yeah, not necessarily like a town, but just kind of like a campsite from what I understand. Like a motorcycle, motorcycle rally. Yeah, that's exactly like right. Sturgis. That's exactly right. My computer just died. It had all my notes on it. Oh, no. Hang on, I I got uh, Google Docs on my phone. Oh, computer's turning back on. Well, it says it's not plugged in, but it is most definitely plugged in. Anyways, um, oh, there it goes again. Okay, three the days of the mountain man are like kind of coming to an end, just because of a number of factors. But the price of fur is one. The lack of game like they'd kind of trap the beaver so much that they're just the numbers were starting to dwindle and it wasn't really profitable to do what they were doing anymore so a lot of these trappers and you know what we loosely refer to as mountain men they became guides because by this time so they were out in front a little bit of like if you think of he was born in 1804 when lewis and clark went west And then, like, uh, the 49ers, 1849, they had gold in California. And so all those guys, like, at that point are kind of starting, it becomes more popular for people to want to move west. Mm -hmm. Um, So so the, like, the peak mountain man fur trapping times is kind of that zone in between there when settlers or whoever really haven't started going that way yet. So they were kind of out ahead of that. Well, then when the beaver trapping slowed down, they had to find something else to do. Well, most of them knew the wilderness and everything so well, they became guides. So they would have along these trails, like the Santa Fe, the Oregon Trail and such, they would have a little outpost where you could stop and get coffee or sugar or whatever, gunpowder along the along the way. And a lot of these guys would just be at a, at a station. So there was a Fort Bridger along the Oregon trail that he worked at and he would just kind of, he'd see the wagon train coming in um, and assess them and kind of give them advice on what they need, what uh, supplies to bring, which way to go, et cetera. So he kind of was the, the perfect intersection of he was born, he lived through the peak of the trapping craze. And then he followed what a lot of those same people did, which was become guides some of them became buffalo hunters and things like that, but he became a he became a guide and uh, he ended up being a scout up for Colonel Carrington up at Fort Fort Phil Kearney, depending on who you talk to or who you ask. But the Fetterman massacre or the Battle of the Hundred in the Hand, um, he was a scout or guide up up for that. But that's basically where this group of how uh, they were soldiers, U.S. soldiers, got killed by. Uh, the Sioux up there, Crazy Horse and those guys. So 1846, he's at Fort Bridger and a wagon train rolls up and it's a party of people, if you will, and they want some advice. And there's like a proposed shortcut to where they're going to and kind of off the beaten trail, but it's a kind of a talked about 
shortcut. And Bridger tells these guys, he says, yeah, it's a, it's a fine level road. There's plenty of water and grass with the exception of there's a 40 mile waterless stretch. It ended up, so the stretch that he was referring to is actually 80 miles. And uh, the people who came there, you may have guessed, but it was the Donner Party. And they're those guys who got, it was a big group of people. They got trapped out in the Sierra Nevada mountains over the winter. It's like a big wagon train got stuck and uh, ended up eating themselves. Ah. Yeah. Well, they got, so they got found. Obviously, some of them were still alive, but had eaten, eaten each other. It wasn't a family. There's like 50 to 100 people or something. Yeah. I don't know why they called them the Donner Party, but yeah, they ended up eating. Uh, and I think it's, it's been a while since I looked into them, but. I think uh, they ate the kids and stuff first, which is kind of why. Oh, 87 members of the party, 48 survived. Hmm. Over half. But uh, yeah, I don't know why they call them the Donners. Donner party of 87. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the Donner Pass. Okay, that must be why. Or was that named after? Well, that's a good question here. Now known as the Donner Pass. Uh, yeah, it was October 20, and they'd been told the pass would not be snowed in until the middle of November. By J- Jim Bridger? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Bridger's the guy who told them that uh, <laughs> the road was fine, <laughs> and uh, it tur- turned out it wasn't. So, Two of the more interesting things, the Donner Party that he <laughs> led astray, and then the Fetterman Massacre was a pretty kind of well-known event he had a role although i don't he didn't really have a very big role during the fetterman massacre i don't from anything i could find he did it but i don't really there wasn't like one thing he did where oh he found this or he you know he found this trail or um john c fremont i think I referenced him earlier. They called him the Pathfinder. He found some sort of trail or something out to California or something like that. But Bridger never really did any of that. All he did was just, he was like kind of the, he lived the life of the typical mountain man. He just popped his head up and some of the, you know, more interesting little, any little kind of interesting thing. It seems like he was there, but he was never really the main guy. (laughs) Anything was happening to, you know. Huh. He was just kind of like the uh, Forrest Gump sort of guy where he just kind of had his, like any big event, he just kind of seemed to yeah. pop, pop up at sort of thing. So at 13, he was orphaned and he had no formal education, so he never could read or write. He was illiterate for his whole life. And he went to work uh, being an apprentice for a blacksmith so he did that for five years and then at 18 well, I don't know if he did it for five years he did it for a little while but then at 18 he decided he was done with the blacksmith and then um, there's an ad in the paper I think he was in St. Louis at the time but it was a guy by the name of uh, General William Henry Ashley and he had a fur trapping expedition that he was going to go up the Missouri River Jim saw the ad in the paper and responded to it and said he would go do that. Uh, but Jedediah Smith, he was also in that in that party. And uh, Hugh Glass, which the name Hugh Glass probably doesn't mean a whole lot to you, but if have you seen The Revenant? I don't think I've ever seen it. I remember it's kind of a big deal when it came out or a lot of talk about it. Yeah, so it was it was based on a guy by the name of Hugh Glass who was in the expedition that Bridger was in and he got uh, mauled by a bear in survival. They made a movie about it and Leonardo de Leonardo DiCaprio. So he played Hugh Glass? Yeah. All I remember is he had to like crawl inside of a bear carcass or something. Yeah, I think it if I remember right it was a horse maybe, but yeah, to spend the so night. So he's so Jim Jim's young on this expedition yeah so he's real he's young but this is like kind of the start of his his fur trapping experience and so he's working like i said when hugh glass was attacked they were up in south dakota the glass 
deal, the bear attack, it's pretty well well written about and well known. So he was attacked by a bear, and then they left a guy by the name of John Fitzgerald, and then someone that they just knew as Bridges to stay with them. And basically they were just waiting on uh, Hugh Glass to die while the other guys in the trapping party would continue trapping. You know, they couldn't all just hang around waiting on the one guy, so they left these two guys back. Allegedly, they were digging his grave, and they were interrupted by a native tribe, attacked him. And they took this Bridges guy, and uh, John Fitzgerald took Glass's rifle and knife and kind of everything else and just took off and left him, uh, presumably to be, you know, they thought he was dead, and uh, went back and told... Uh, General Ashley's group that he had died. So yeah, Hugh Glass, after he got mauled by the bear and he just tore him apart, he couldn't walk or anything like that. And uh, Bridger and Fitzgerald abandoned him and left him for dead and took all his uh, gun and supplies and everything like that. He basically decided he was going to crawl back to the nearest settlement. I think it was Fort, Fort Kiowa. It was like 350 miles away, and uh, he was like, oh, just, he was crawling along, and then some a tribe found him and got him there, but he was going to exact revenge on Fitzgerald and, and uh, Bridger. Well, he finally, he gets to the fort, and then he gets, um, he, it was the opposite way of where the fur trading party was going, so he was like 350 miles uh, back east, and then he was going west out to the Yellowstone area where Bridgerton and Fitzgerald presumably were. And he gets to the, finally catches up with the trapping company, and uh, Fitzgerald isn't there, but Bridger is. And so he probably didn't like kick in the door, but you picture him kicking in the door, and he's going to fire a round off at old Bridger, but he didn't. He couldn't bring himself to do it, something that. Yeah. You know, about the... Showed mercy on him. Look in his eyes or something. Yeah, yeah, he was just a kid, basically. So he said he couldn't do it to a kid. But that Hugh Glass guy, he's kind of an interesting dude because he was uh, he was a pirate for a while, and then he was living with, um, I think it's the Pawnee tribe. And so he, you know, this guy's just kind of a... It wasn't like he was all raised in a house for 18 years, and then he went trapping he's lived some life you know and then he eventually he's still wants to kill fitzgerald even though he wasn't gonna kill bridger and when he finally catches up with fitzgerald who wasn't i don't know if he wasn't in the fur trading party or just wasn't there or whatever it was but he finally catches up with them it's at some fort like he's uh working for the u.s army so he couldn't do anything about it without getting thrown in jail so he ends up not killing either one of them but hmm. That's kind of what was driving him to crawl through the snow and his everything was all ripped up. Yeah, it's a pretty crazy story, really. There was some account about how he had to like smash blueberries or something to get him to, like he couldn't swallow <laughs> Just shove food, it down so his he was throat. having to like sh- shut, yeah. So he was, this guy was in pretty rough shape. So in 1868, he went back to Missouri, which is where he was kind of from and he went blind actually and then died but throughout the course of his life he had three wives all of them native women so one was from a flathead tribe she had three kids and died of a fever then he married the daughter of a Shoshone chief who died during childbirth and then it, and then he married the daughter of another Shoshone chief and they raised two kids so three different wives I guess that'd be five kids, and um, I didn't write this down, but I saw at some point that, like, if you track most all of his kids died, I think he ended up having, like, one living kid when he died just through various, like, oh, Susie got smallpox or whatever like Crazy. that. <laughs> but, yeah, but he was kind of famous for tell, telling tall tales. Like I said earlier, one of his stories was he was being chased by – hundred Cheyenne and they chased him to the edge of the canyon and then he would just stop talking and whoever was listening would have to say, well, what happened? He'd say, they killed me. Or another one he liked to tell was 
He went to a petrified forest that had petrified birds singing petrified songs. So I don't really know what that would even be like. But Storytelling doesn't quite translate. To, it's like comedy. Yeah, yeah, I know. That's why. Yeah, I just like comedy from the 50s or 60s or whatever. Like watching like, the first, first SNL episode. Yeah, but. I mean, I'm sure that probably caused a riot at the campfire at the, you know, back in the day. Oh, Jim, man, that's that's good stuff. We'll see what this bridge. I mean, you may have to just throw this away. <laughs> the more I looked into him, the more disappointed I got. <laughs> it was like this dude, really, from all I could tell, he didn't do anything of note. <laughs> you know, I thought. I don't know. I was just like, he's the most famous mountain man I can think of. And I kind of Googled some other ones and looked around a little bit. I just wanted to do, I had my heart stuck on a mountain man. And <laughs> it's like, well, I guess I'll do him. There's absolutely nothing. He was just, I think, one of those guys where he became, I mean, good at what he did and well known through that, to where he just became kind of synonymous as a with the term mountain man may have to scrap this one who knows <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>